sediment load numbers do not correlate to these ecological communities <laughs> in, 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 in much of a meaningful way, um, which, which is, you know, obviously caused problems because we're chasing those numbers, whether it's for local TMDL or the Chesapeake Bay, um, but, but we're not seeing it connect directly to the, to the ecological function. Um, another, another challenge we face in thinking about stream restoration is, is the scale. Um, if we look at streams in small reaches, um, you know, we end up focused on, on you know, a, a potentially eroding bank here or um, access to floodplain there or, you know, very, very local riparian sorts of issues. If we look at that at more of a landscape scale, which is hard because it's it's challenging, it's um, it's a, it's certainly a larger effort. There's a lot more landowners involved, and it's going to cost you know perhaps more resources. But we start to look at the landscape in, impacts of the watershed on the stream, and we look at it more as a as a continuum, and and look at the functions and values of the stream across its entirety instead of just trying to evaluate one little piece. Um, so there's a lot of reasons it makes sense, but there's challenges to doing so, and we need to recognize that. Um, perhaps the, the big, you know, inconvenient truth about streams is their dynamic systems. They are not static in place or time or function, and, and that's challenging for us as a society. Um, it would be really convenient if the stream just played it stayed in one space, one spot. Um, it's challenging for our infrastructure. Um, it's challenging for landowners and and agricultural use and backyards. But but streams are dynamic because that's how they respond to changes. It, whether that's um, climate and storm intensity changes or changes in land use in the watershed. The ability of, of the stream uh, to respond to those changes okay, from a geomorphic and hydro, hydrologic standpoint is really critical. And when we, in the, in the context of restoration, try to fix the channel in place, whether that's laterally or, or at, for elevation, we really limit the, the ability of that stream to respond and adapt. Um, and that resilience that's built into the streams, as we remove it, um, you know, we might hold something stable for a given reach, but it, we will have ripples upstream or downstream as things continue to change and the stream is no longer to, able to be resilient and, and dynamic through its entire reach, through the entire watershed. Um, um, so it's, uh, it's, it's a reality that is, complicated and it is particularly complicated in, um, in urban and suburban areas. Um, so, so to take a moment and um, create a little different perspective on some things we might see out there, uh, I wanna take us to Segalock Run, which is an exceptional value um, wild brook trout stream in Northern Lancaster County. This. This is about as good as streams get in South Central Pennsylvania. Um, beautiful wild trout. Uh, the, the assemblage of stoneflies is something we just don't see very much in this part of the state. Um, gorgeous little creek, um, not pristine. So in, this, in the Revolutionary War period, this area was clear cut for Iron production, I'm sure the stream had cut the whole way through the watershed. It is a little entrenched, um, but it has adapted and healed and is unarguably a, a very impressive, highly functioning ecosystem. Um, so we do have, we have eroding banks just like this. Erosion is a natural process. This bank has moved probably two and a half or three feet in the last 20 years. Um, so it may look, it may look problematic, but it, it's so bound together by roots that it's not going anywhere. The 
even though it, it doesn't uh, appeal to our aesthetic oftentimes. Um, we do have some areas where there are active erosion faces. Um, this is the stream coming to the edge of the floodplain, starting to bump into that valley wall a little bit. Um, it's a natural process. This is, this is the way our models see erosion, where, where that sediment is mobilized. Um, what the models don't do so well is this part. Um, you know, just 100 yards downstream from that erosion face, after a large storm, the deposition is on, out on the floodplain, uh, not, not being exported to the Susquehanna River or the Chesapeake Bay, but maintained in the same landscape. Uh, there's, you, you know, whether it's on the, the building edge of a point bar on, on the floodplain, we tend to underestimate how much sediment is absorbed into the systems themselves, even though, even though it's generated, it's not, it's not necessarily exported. Um, and again, you, you can see this deposition. Um, another thing we, we like streams to do is we like them to stay in one place. Thank you very much. And particularly not to take up extra space on the landscape. Um, so this is a stream. It's in, it's in game lands. Uh, it's currently activating two old two channel pathways um, because of woody debris movement during storm events and, um, and significant, you know, big storm events and, uh, you know, the audacity of a stream to take up that much landscape, right? I mean, if this was happening in a park or in a subdivision, we'd see a problem that needs to be fixed. Um, and we, we tend to frame it as a stream problem, but it's really a cultural problem. We just, we don't like it to do that. Um, a colleague of mine once referred to a stream um, not respecting its banks. And I, you know, my first inclination um, was a smart aleck answer. <laughs> you know, how, how dare it? Uh, but, but upon a little reflection, it really, it really speaks to how we view um, our waters sometimes and, and that it's, <laughs> that view is not really bounded in an understanding of science, but in cultural convenience. Um, and they're in part of the, is part of the challenge. So, so when we think about restoration of these watersheds, um, you know, rather than thinking about a particular section of bank or a particular, um, particular section of bed or, or riparian zone, I think it really helps us to think about this in terms of processes. Um, so at a watershed scale, we're, we're trying to sustain the natural physical, chemical, and biological processes that, um, that enable and encourage that dynamic stability of our stream systems. Uh, so that's, I mean, it's sort of a mouthful and, and a headful when you start to think about what, what that means, but it does, it does sort of force us out of this narrow reach viewpoint that we we often end up in. Um, another thing to, and I should say, obviously we can't always do this. Um, and, and our infrastructure may be the best example of that. You know, we, we need to have streams that line up with bridges, right? Or things get really hairy and expensive and dangerous pretty quickly. So, so we do make exceptions, even in the best of cases. Um, I'd also note that we should be thoughtful about setting goals, recognizing that we are, we are not going back to some predetermined, um, you know, pristine condition, almost ever, you know, perhaps there are some exceptions to that, but, um, you know, we, we live, work, we grow our food on this landscape, the, the landscape has changed significantly over the, particularly the last three or 400 years as we have timbered and farmed and built dams and eradicated beavers and controlled wildfires, you know, we, it is just not the same landscape it used to be. So, so we do need to be thinking about that. Um, so what, what, what does work? You know, what, what do we think about in terms of 
watershed restoration and, and sort of restoring watersheds for our streams. Well, forest buffers work. Um, you know, I, I assume I'm sort of preaching to the choir um, with this group on that issue, but but for a lot of the for for reasons that address um, a lot of our stream ecosystem concerns that aren't captured by nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment. Um, you know, the, the temperature regulation that comes from a canopy and a forest surrounding our stream is critically important to the ecosystem, particularly in the heat of the summer. Um, the improved habitat that comes from recruited woody debris and the, and the more variable, diverse structure of the stream bottom, the food web that's based in the the input of, of leaves and organic materials, but also the dissolved organic materials that seep through the, the forest stuff and come through the base flow into the stream. Um, we know these streams, healthy streams, provide incredibly rich ecosystem services for us. Um, and and, and much of that comes from the, the surrounding forest land. Um, these, these buffers and these values but on one hand, they're just easy to see. This is a stream in uh, outside of Manheim, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is a, a reach flowing through a pasture. You can step across it. Um, not 100 yards away in the forest, that same stream looks like this. Um, the, the visual impact of a, of a stream in a healthy forest setting is, is really significant. Um, We've also, we've also measured a lot of these functions. So we, so we know and are pretty comfortable with this. If you look, uh, this is White Clay Creek um, at, at Stroud's lab. Uh, at the bottom of the photo is the reach of the stream maintained in, in, a, in a meadow condition. Uh, yeah, obviously this isn't, this isn't a beat up um, pasture with you know, 300 Holsteins in it. This is you know, no livestock meadow condition. The, uh, the street, the reach of the stream that that um, is in the center of the photo in, in woods, but you can see sort of younger woods um, be north of Spencer Road there. The forest is about 20 to 25 years old. Um, and then there's a third reach I'll show you, which is up. You can see the at the top of the photo, you can see the, the more mature, larger, older uh, woody habitat that's about 80 to 100 years old. Um, so in the meadow reach, we have this very uniform run. Um, it's banks there are probably three to four feet high, covered in you know the, the remains of invasive vines. And you can use the, uh, see that fiberglass rod there just for a little bit of perspective. We'll move that around. Um, but this is, um, you know, fairly typical of what we see in a, in a meadow or pasture setting. Um, when we move a little bit upstream into, a, into the forest that's about 20, 25 years old, you can see it's already about twice as wide. Um, less, less water here, the stream gains, so there's springs and the further downstream you go, the more water it has in. Um, you can start to see the habitat diversity building. Uh, you can see that with this wider, this overall wider channel, it's, it's easier to pass higher flows with less erosive force. Um, and, and you can see that this is the same, same reach, a little bit different place, but you can see that it's starting to recruit the large woody debris that will enable a much more diverse set of habitats and, and provide habitat for um, fisheries, birds, egg masses for macroinvertebrates, all sorts of things. Um, and then finally up, up in the uh, more mature forest, um, you, you see it's even wider still, probably three times the width it was in the pasture. Um, and, and it's much less mobile. While, while this stream is still adapting to a watershed that has agriculture above it, um, you, you know, it's just moving much more slowly across that floodplain. So in, it, in addition and beyond buffers, um, when we think about watershed restoration, um, you know, it's, it's a, 
it, it, I think it should be more obvious, but we just don't think it through often enough. We're never going to resolve the problems of a stream, you know, within the one per, you know, less than one percent of the landscape that the riparian area occupies. You know, we're going to have to work on the landscape, and so, so how do we do that? How do we impact that stream in, you know, the most effective and cost-effective ways that we can? And one of the things so I'll, I'll approach this a bit from an ag side. There are certainly corollaries in the in the suburban and urban side, but we have to address um, the impairments that start on the landscape. Uh, some of them, some of the work is expensive, but you really can't expect to have uh, a lot of improved ecosystem in a stream where you've got manure runoff hemorrhaging into the creek, um, either chronically or with every rain event. Um, and, and there's a host of BMPs we, we've gotten really, I think, pretty good at at improving on the on the landscape around our farms, uh, we have a lot of work to do yet. Um, but but this is this is work we know how to do. Um, conservation districts, NRCS, um, ag consultants do this work well and repeatedly. Um, maybe maybe the most exciting thing that's that's new as we're thinking about this on the landscape is is a focus on soil health and the the resilience this adds to the watershed in terms of carbon storage, um, in terms of the actual farm production. So there's, there's um, production benefits to thinking about the practices like, like uh, no-till and, and cover cropping that improve our soil health. Uh, from a stream perspective, one of the more exciting issues is, is infiltration. Um, Ray Artoleta, who was a, a one of the pioneers in the soil health discussion at NRCS um, used to say this all the time, we, we don't have a runoff problem, we have an infiltration problem. And when we treat and manage our soils differently, we can see that infiltration rate increase by as much as 300%, um, even more in some cases we've seen anecdotally. But, but when you step back for a minute and you think about tripling or quadrupling the infiltration rate on thousands and tens of thousands of acres of soil and what that means to storm flow conditions in streams, what it means to downstream community floodings, it's really astonishing the volumes of water we're talking about. And, and, and that should really make us think a little bit differently about do we, do we try to manage hydrology different on the uplands or do we simply wait until it gets to the stream and try to put band-aids on it in the stream channel? Um, there's, there's a couple ways this really works for us. In addition to reducing those flood peaks and the, and the runoff in the, in the storm events, um, that infiltrating water contributes to base flow cool base flow for our streams throughout the year, and particularly in those summer months, um, that cool base flow can make a tremendous difference for the ecosystem of the stream. Um, I just wanted to touch on large woody debris. I, I, I don't want folks to think, I don't believe there's any structural work that we can or should do at all. I, you know, if we work on buffers, we need to recognize that, that there's a time horizon there. Um, you know, 10, 20 years is that, and more as that buffer is starting to evolve and recruit woody debris, we can jumpstart that. Um, you know, these are just three examples from White Clay Creek, um, Elk Creek up in Sullivan County, Pennsylvania, and Avalanche Run from um, Glacier National Park. You know, woody debris is a key part of our, eco, our stream ecosystems across the country. Um, and some places have, are, are far ahead of us, actually, in terms of thinking about how to use it in a watershed restoration context. Uh, the Pacific Northwest is, was probably one of the first places they started, but uh, I should note, you know, the Forest Service um, in the Northeast is, is doing this kind of work. Um, you know, we're seeing it be more widely applied, and it really is a great sort of habitat jumpstart and for, for streams where we're waiting um, for buffers or landscape changes to take to have a greater impact. Um, one of the questions I think we, 
we see people asking is, what if we just give the stream a little more reach, a little more room to, to be dynamic, to adapt to those, uh, the, these changes? And particularly in Vermont, um, I, I think in the aftermath of hurricanes, Lee and Irene, uh, you know, they had just such tremendous damage, um, infrastructure damage, you know, and, and got to the point, I think, where it was simply a, there's a financial discussion to be had, you know, can we keep rebuilding after these storm events? And so uh, the state put some protocols and, and had a lot of discussions and was sort of urging the towns and local governments to think about stepping back from those river corridors. And that's it's not an easy thing to do. It's been a contentious conversation some places, but it's, it's sort of an interesting early example of folks saying, well, you know, maybe we just need to structure our culture a little bit differently and avoid some of these costs that we can't, we just can't keep incurring. Um, that gives, that creates this, this, um, this space for the streams and rivers to respond to, you know, the different, the, the increasing rainfall intensities we're seeing with climate change. Um, and, and you know, we're, we're sort of guessing on how some of that will play out. But if we step back, we let the system adapt to it naturally and, and come to equilibrium again. Um, and I, I still I think this is still something we, we're going to have to spend some time on. You know, I'm not sure we know why this approach hasn't delivered more of the outcomes we'd hoped. Um, this, this, the engineered channel approach, um, I mean, some things make sense that you're not going to be able to resolve the impact of the entire watershed within the riparian zone. But, but clearly, we need to learn how to do this better because there are places where structural work is going to be necessary to protect infrastructure investments. Um, and learning how to do that better is, is still something we have to be focused on. Um, but there still may be things we're missing and things we're concerned about. Um, you know, are, 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 is the way we're monitoring missing some things? Do we see peaks or pulses of, of um, chemicals of concern that, that we're not capturing or aware of? Um, there's certainly, you know, we're, there's always new pesticides and herbicides being developed to sort of keep up. Um, neonicotinoids in, in seed coatings, um, there was some scrutiny early on. People, you know, I think there was a, some level of comfort that, that there was not going to be significant problems. And I, I think we've blown right by that assumption at this point. You know, we have neonics in groundwater, we have it in stream water, we have it in our water supplies. Um, you know, farms are seeing the impact it's having on their um, IPM integrated pest management systems. Uh, so I think that's somewhere we're going to spend a, you know, a lot more time. I mean, we're, we're thinking about road salt and the volumes of salt that go into winter road maintenance in ways we weren't even aware of before. Um, and you know, I think we've been wrestling with pharmaceuticals in our water for a long time and not sure exactly how to go about resolving it. So there are these, these other things which undoubtedly affect the stream ecosystem that aren't really cooked into our restoration thinking very effectively yet. Um, and I think at the end of the day, after we do a better job with many of these details that we, that I, you know, we just sort of mentioned, um, the, the temporal question is still there. Um, you know, there's things that may be in groundwater and, and that's gonna take a different different time to cycle out in different, different geologies, different places. Um, we, we, we know that our BMPs mature and are effective over different time frames and, um, you know, have different lifespans. So, so integrating all of that into our thinking about watershed restoration is important. Um, this is, this is not something we're done learning about. And uh, as I said at the beginning, I, I you know I, I look forward to to a longer, richer conversation about these things um, as as we all start trying to you know keep 
continue figuring out how to do what we do better. And with that, I will wrap it up. Um, Zach, happy to, we can take questions or whatever works. Yeah, thank you so much, Matt. And uh, we do have a couple questions, so we'll just dive right into it. This one here is from um, Steve Johnston Ball. He asked, uh, what are your thoughts on the usefulness of creating large scale floodplains uh, at appropriate elevations? Um, I'm assuming that's restore a large scale floodplain uh, to encourage and allow natural sediment deposition um, as you showed in your slide. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I think, it's another place where obviously I think we're still learning, you know, figuring out where to do that effectively. You know, it's not, it's not cheap work. Um, I, I actually think we can do the floodplain restoration work in many cases without the extensive channel modification. We can, we can let that channel still be adaptive while uh, creating floodplains that, that restore the, the wetland habitat, that restore, um, you know, the, the ability for more nutrient processing and sediment trapping. Um, and I, I, think, I think we're getting better about that. It, um, the, the, the challenge, one of the challenges in this is always whether, whether you're talking about the, the stream channel or floodplains is that, um, you know, you have one or two, you have some landowners who want to work with you. And, and you want to do something there. And the question is, is, is that the right, the right place for the, you know, the right techniques at the right time? And, um, and that, that can be the challenging part because, you know, the, the best, most effective place to sort of invest in the floodplain work may, may not be on the landowner who you have saying yes at the moment. Um, so, you know, obviously there's, there's things other than there's, uh, social science as well as science <laughs> coming into that conversation. Yeah, it's always a, an important factor to remember. Um, we have also have a lot of interest uh, on, you know, how to, you know, apply this to more urban settings. So specifically, um, Tali asked a question, do you have a similar whole landscape slide for urban settings uh, outlining what needs to be done across the landscape in an urban setting uh, that could help uh, for, uh, improve stream quality? And I think it was when you had shown the aerial view of the farm and then outlined all the different practices that could be done. Yeah. So, so that's a great question. And I, I think one thing you have to say right up front is urban, urban landscapes and even suburban landscapes are more challenging. And, and in part, uh, that, that is driven by the, the increased impervious surface. Um, so we've, we've really exacerbated our, um, our runoff problems because of all the impervious surface. So infiltration, you know, continues to be a key piece of this. Um, I think there's real questions about what, what sort of ecological lift to expect out of some of these urban systems. Um, I think if we, if we own what we've done, um, we've, we've tried to build naturalized, uh, aesthetically attractive conveyances that that resemble streams, but functionally, you know, come a lot closer to a concrete channel in some ways. And, and that's, that's a challenge because we want, we want that water quality functionality back. We also, we also want the, the opportunity for people to interact with streams in, in those communities and um, to have some of the social values there. Uh, so, so figuring out, you know, maybe we make investments that we wouldn't consider making in, in, a, in a more rural landscape, in part because more people use it. Um, and, and I think we can be, we can be clear about that. And we shouldn't feel bad about, you know, trying to equate, to not equate everything to an ecological lift, perhaps. Um, but, but clearly, you know, folks are doing more and more to try to improve infiltration it's probably an easier lift in a suburban landscape where you've got more, more open space to work with, um, little you know lower percentage of, of impervious area. Um, I think the I think the soil health conversation is going to trickle into the to the suburban reality and and thinking about so how do we how do we go from 
the fairly sterile cool season grass lawns everywhere to, um, to something that can be acceptable to people but still function much better from a watershed standpoint. That would be a perfect segue into tomorrow, tomorrow's sessions, which will be outlining the uh, lawn conversion program that we have here at DCNR, which Kelsey will be telling us more about. So stay tuned for that. Um, yeah, and then we definitely have a couple comments and more in support of, you know, improving soil health will improve infiltration and, and thus improve water quality. Um, Ann Harrison Strang mentioned, you know, that being a, a, a great um, kind of a upland practice that can help forest buffers um, as far as controlling concentrated flows that would be entering those buffers. Uh, and then Steve uh, Johnson Ball also mentioned uh, low hanging fruit for manure management is incentivizing uh, dairy to upgrade manure ponds into biodigesters um, that'll produce and collect methane, fuel electrical microgeneration plant, uh, power their farm and feedback into the power grid. The payback is quick on that investment. Uh, outputs more stable, and then you can use that composted organic material to supplement soil health. So um, I like that comment, you know, kind of outlining the, the way that some of these practices could also in, be not just uh, benefiting soil health and water quality, but uh, the landowners themselves as well. So. I, I think we're going to see increased and, and more intentional intersection of this, you know, the, the sort of environmental quality discussion with the uh, resilience and the energy discussions. And, and I, think, I think we have the potential to do that far better than we have in the past. Um, it is gonna be challenging in some ways because our, our, ag, um, our ag production sectors are, are really evolving now too, in, in, in part due to the pandemic, in part due to you know, different economic stimulus um, reality or eco economic realities on the farms. So, um, you know, I, th I think there's going to be a lot of shifting, but a lot more intersection than we've seen in the past. All right, and I think that uh, about wraps up the questions, unless I missed anything, Derek. Um, so for those of you um, that are tuning in for the rest of the day, we will have our next session. Just remember that will be back on the live stream link uh, in your agenda so you will no longer be tuning into Zoom. Um, yeah, I want to thank you, Matt, for your presentation, um, taking your time today, and thank everybody for tuning in. Thanks, and, and as, I, as I said earlier, as people are stepping out, um, I, I re we really welcome you to be thinking about that and, and, and reaching out to us and others, because I, I think this discussion about you know, we've got limited resources to do this. How do we get how do we get the most out of that? And, and how do we best serve the most people? Thank you so much, Matt.